Hi, Paul Beckwith, University of Ottawa and uh, Carleton University, Laboratory for Paleoclimatology in the former, Department of Geography and Environmental Studies in the latter. I'm talking about the destruction of the coral reefs, specifically the huge bleaching event that is occurring um, recently on the Great Barrier Reef, following on the heels of an even larger bleaching in 2016, followed by a large bleaching, or proceeding, following rather, a large bleaching in 1998 during a very strong El Nino, also in 2002, prior to that, 82, 83, strong El Nino, when we first started seeing bleaching occurring. So I was talking about the coral environment here and what coral bleaching is. The colorful algae, the zooanthellae, the water's too warm, so they just take off, they bail from the coral. They leave the skeleton, the calcium, white calcium skeleton that's been built up by polyps remaining. If the water cools down, um, they can return or other ones from nearby healthy coral can move over and occupy the coral that was bleached, reviving it, but this can take many years. Back-to-back -back bleaching, forget it. It's just gonna finish off the coral that's in that region. So these zooanthellae, they work in an internal symbiotic uh, relationship they do the photosynthesis and they provide nutrients, which helps the uh, reef building corals create the structures. Okay, so it loses the zooanthellae and will die in a matter of weeks unless the zooanthellae can be replaced. Okay, so the living colors are due to the zooanthellae. When they leave, the corals go white or bleached. They look like, it looks like bone, a boneyard. Um, tissue growth is halted, skeletal accretion is stopped. They just basically stop, and then once the zooanthellae die, the soft tissue becomes a food source for scavengers, so it gets broken down and you basically get sand and so on, you get seaweeds occupying it and other opportunistic organisms. Okay, so um, if favorable conditions return, coral larvae can settle on the reef, rebuilding, renewing the reef building process. But when it's reduced to rubble, fish and other marine organisms can no longer are no longer supported. Local human populations are at risk. The fishing stocks are greatly diminished. There's shoreline erosion because the reefs protect the shore. So these uh, bleaching events are affecting every reef region in the world. This, the spatial extent's been increasing, the severity's been increasing. Worldwide bleaching first occurred in 1998. They, it destroyed 16% of the world's reefs. This was a very powerful El Nino. The Great Barrier Reef was affected by this, also in 2002 by another event. And then uh, the worst since then, the worst then, then last year in 2016, that El Nino, hugely powerful El Nino, did a huge number on it. There was another small event here. But in 2017, there's no El Nino. I can't emphasize that enough. So here's what we have with healthy coral. Okay, you have the zooanthellae, you know, all parked into the Reef, bleached corals, temp water's too hot, temperature's too high, these guys take off. And then this, so this, so you just see the white structure underneath, you lose all the color from the, there's the coral polyps, the calcified uh, coral, and then uh, this filamentace, filamentous algae, filamentaceous algae covers it, darkens it, so then you can't see it from the air. Okay, so that's the procedure uh, before bleaching, after bleaching, before bleaching, after bleaching, before bleaching here, after bleaching. Okay, so it just, it just takes out the reef. You know, the causes are intense solar radiation, especially UV wavelengths, reduction of marine salinity, okay? If the water freshens too much, then there's bleaching. Unless the coral is adapted for fresh water, they found some reefs at the outlets of rivers and things. Um, if it's exposed to the air by extremely low tides or low sea level, that uh, is not healthy. Sedimentation, that blocks sunlight getting to it. Xenobiotics, so that's contaminants that, do, that kill the, the uh, xenoplankton, uh, stress-related plankton. But the, the biggest, so tropical cyclones and things, elevated sea surface temperature, so many different factors, but you know, it's a rise in temperature and light.
but um, does it. These zooanthellites grow in a preferred range of abiotic, meaning uh, local non-biological conditions, temperature, uh, etc., sedimentation, uh, salinity. If you go outside their operating range, their niche, then they, they don't like it, they leave, they, mi they migrate and the coral bleaches. Okay, so heat stress, rising water temperature. Okay, the coral, the, 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 um, the coral actually spits out remaining zoanthellae after some of them have left. Um, and uh, so there's, uh, you know, different things can affect it, like current, ocean currents transport pools of warm water, sometimes delivering them to reef regions. And I suspect that some of that is going on. Stay tuned in a couple of days for the release of my book on, or my book, my video on, um, on uh, ocean current changes. Okay, there's things like storm water from heavy rains that can make the water turbid, cutting down the light, harming the reef, chemicals, pathogens. There's different diseases in the corals, uh, things like that. Excess nutrients that causes phytoplankton blooms can cut down the number of light, okay, and so on. Okay, so this is a very good article. Um, again, some of the important Coral reefs provide nearly $400 billion a year to millions of people in economics, goods, and s ecosystem services. Medicines, new medical compounds and technology, talked about it. Tourism, recreation, they attract millions of tourists who are going to have to go down coal mines in Australia when the reefs are dead. Some countries derive more than half of their GMP, gross national product, from coral reef industries. Those are many different islands, for example. Uh, in the Caribbean or in the mid-Pacific. Uh, food and fishing, they provide, the food and fish and shellfish provide protein for one billion people. And the reefs have a big component of that. Without reefs, where are we gonna, how are we gonna feed those one billion people? Uh, they, they're homes and nurseries for a quarter of all marine life. 250,000 known species, uh, habitat, uh, coral reefs provide habitat for 250,000 known species, more than 4,000 species of fish, 700 species of coral, many species have yet to be discovered, more than a million species are associated with coral reefs. Okay, so they're found in over 100 countries, they act as a wave barrier, they protect communities and beaches from storm damage. They're vitally important. You know, here this is just showing how overfishing and dragging things across the reef can harm it. Um, and there's lots of other different things here. But I want to look at the sea surface temperature because that's the kicker right now. So look, if we just click on this, this is Climate Reanalyzer. I tried to get Earth Null School, but the server's down right now. So if we go over to Australia, it's interesting. What we're seeing is lots of war very warm water in the southern hemisphere. Um, the water temperature peaks about mid-March in the southern hemisphere. So here's what we have in Australia. So I haven't heard of the bleaching down here. We're talking about this region. So this is April 10th. So if you look um, over the last month, there's been excessively warm water. You can cycle back in time. There's been excessively warm water here, which is causing the bleaching, but it's no El Nino situation. So let's have a look. This is, one of, this is the best article that I've seen. It's, it's interviews at Yale 360. It interviews a marine uh, a, a coral reef researcher. Okay, this is the bleached coral. This is, looks like some healthier coral. You know, the stuff that's got a lot of detail and structure, very fine, um, is not going to have a big thermal mass. So hot water is just going to nuke that, basically, get all the zooanthellae out. If you talk about uh, more massive corals, like this guy here, you know, brain coral, there's some brain coral here. There's another, these guys here, maybe that's just, a, that's coral too, it's a, on a rock or something. This coral does a bit better because it's got a much larger mass. So it takes a lot more, a lot warmer water for a longer period of time to get the zooanthellae out of those guys. But this stuff is all, is all cleaned out. You know, any of the fan coral stuff with the large surface area to volume ratio gets cleaned out just because of the thermal uh, properties. Okay, so... So this is an inter... Okay, so, yeah, 1,400 miles stretching along Australia's northeast coast. Largest living structure on Earth. 
Now it's the world's largest dying structure on Earth. So Terry Hughes, biologist, director of a center in Australia um, that studies it, you know, is, re is reporting um, on more grim news, okay? So the bleaching this year is over a 500 mile portion of the reef. Okay, so, you know, it's warming waters from climate change, no question. You know, as the Arctic gets a lot darker, it's absorbing more heat, less heat is flowing there from the equator, more heat's flowing to the southern hemisphere, it gets down to the Australia region, can't get down to Antarctica because of the thermal gradient, so it parks around Australia, taking out the reefs. Okay, this threatens the survival of coral worldwide, and then it can ripple up the food chain. The reef doesn't come back if we have a bleaching event every other year. So it, it, this is shocking. There's a huge feeling of dismay in the science community. Um, huge. People are shocked and horrified. When, they give, when the scientists give lectures, people in the front rows are crying about the Great Barrier Reef. They're searching for answers. But the general public, meh, meh, you know? <laughs> like, it's absurd. It's ridiculous. Come on, people. I mean, are we going to go out with a whimper, not do anything, trying to address climate change? So they looked at three events, 98, 2002, and 2016, and this paper which came out a while ago, and of course the same thing is happening. So they fly a small plane and helicopter over all the reefs, they survey the ones that are white, they have to do it in a, in a short time window, and then they send divers down to complete the survey, measure the fraction of reef alive and dead. Okay, so they categorize them, so 100 researchers underwater to test the accuracy of the score of the of the aerial uh, surveys. So last year, 55% of the reefs surveyed were bleached. Um, that was four times higher than in 1998 or 2002. They went back six months later, two thirds of that coral was dead. So March, April to October, November, dying of the bleached coral. And then the 2017 event is on, a, uh, is on a, the middle third of the reef. So now we're talking about, you know, you can't get a recovery from that. So. Uh, the top two-thirds of the reef have been damaged. Um, you know, this is a fairly modern issue. The first coral bleaching localized in the Caribbean was in 82-83 in the El Nino. Um, the first global event, 1998, and now the reef is actually on its way out. So it talks about pollution, overfishing, climate change, and so on. Um, but El Nino, they normally cause the warmer ocean conditions. La Nina cools down. So the 82, 83, 98 event were strong El Ninos, but this year it's not. Okay, so La Nina years now are warmer than El Nino years were, say, 25, 30 years ago due to global warming. So, so we're getting these, other, these events were El Ninos, now we're getting them without an El Nino. So it's just a matter of time before the reef is gone, you know, way ahead of of, of uh, you know, the book The Weather Makers that was talking about 2040 or 2050 for perhaps losing the reefs. So, you know, he says, okay, he's an optimist. He says, you know, we have to reduce emissions and that's going to be enough. I say we have to reduce emissions, but we also have to cool the planet. Otherwise, you know, I mean, we're killing something that's, that, that's been on the earth for a heck of a long time and it's going it, to, when it's gone, it's gone. You know, the soft corals, they melt away and just vanish. I mean, we saw starfish uh, stressed, you know, off the east coast of the U.S. just a few years ago. Huge starfish mortality as it was getting too warm. Bleaching takes time over several months, goes in various phases. Different corals have different degrees of susceptibility to bleaching. And I talked about the surface area to volume ratio. You know, the higher it is, the more susceptible you are to bleaching. Um, so the mid-meat... Mid-March is the peak in the southern hemisphere because the heat's been built up all winter um, and the susceptible species start losing color and then that can cascade to the more durable species. So the branching corals um, are the most vulnerable, um, whereas the brain corals and these, these thicker corals, slower growing corals, are more hardy, but even some of those are died. 50 to 100 year old corals dying because of the bleaching event. And you've seen this image and there's more about the uh, you know deep water coral 40 meters down bleaching of 30 percent of the corals from deep water coral so so this is uh, this is all going south so uh, 
Basically, you know, here we've got the largest uh, living ecosystem becoming the largest